we are honored to bring Travis Beecham, the creator of Impact Winter, here into Screen Crush with us. Travis, it is an enormous honor to actually get to meet you and talk to you. Thank you for coming on. Likewise, thank you so much for having me. Sorry, Doug couldn't be here. Um, he's outside taking the garbage out. So <laughs> from the beginning of listening to Impact Winter, like we immediately recognized Dracula's influence with the letters and the journal entries and also how that fits into like the structure of an audio story. But I also feel like there's a little bit of Buffy the Vampire Slayer influences as well and a few other things that we pointed out throughout our breakdowns. What other like vampire IPs or stories influenced you in making this? Oh, um, a lot, I've, quite a few. I mean, and not only vampire things, but like non-vampire things as well. Like um, there's a, a, a lot of sort of like kind of loose references to Arthurian mythology as well in there. Um, uh, but uh there's also the um uh carmilla the uh one of the first vampire novels which is like i think it predated dracula uh but but has um has a very famously sort of like uh a, a lesbian sort of like erotic angle to it um and yeah i, I really like i pulled i pulled a lot of stuff i think from like from older sort of vampire traditions because i think in more modern times not always but in a lot of like more modern sort of like vampire fiction it treats it as a disease or as a plague or like a mutation or that kind of thing and tries to sort of in more explicitly incorporate sci-fi elements and i think what i really liked about like you know sort of older vampire stories is you know not only the sensuality and the and the physicality and the and and the kind of like the seductiveness of it, but also the explicitly magical folkloric sort of origins, um, where you know, like in Dracula, kind of the scope of his powers is sort of ill-defined. You know, like he can turn into mist, he can slip through a keyhole, he can do whatever, and um, and there was just something about that that I thought like that's you know those vampires are so cool, and that's like. You know, and you really get the kind of um, why that's seductive and why, you know, and why that would be something that you would want to be and be lured by. Um, and also, I just I love the juxtaposition of like taking what would normally be like a really sci fi setting. Right. The the world post the comic post apocalypse. Yeah. 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 And and taking that sci fi setting and then just dropping something that's just nakedly magical into the middle of it mm -hmm. and having mm -hmm. the people who are from our world having to like deal with that. We, um, in one of our breakdowns talked about how vampire stories tend to reflect the anxiety of their times. So, you know, in the earlier stories like Dracula, Carmel, as you mentioned, um, it was the sphere of the stranger, you know, influencing the, the women and taking away the women from you. And kind of on through, you know, the 21st, uh, the 20th, 21st centuries, vampire stories and monster stories as a whole, Frankenstein's reflection of like industrialization, they all reflect our current anxiety. So you've created this thing, which you know, there's not another vampire story like this. Like what you said blends the post-apocalypse with the magical. What would you think? And we speculated about this in episode one. And I was like, I can't wait to hear in our first breakdowns. And I was like, I can't wait to hear what Travis has to say. What modern day anxieties do you think impact winter is a reflection of well i don't know i i don't know and I, I don't know that i planned it like this but um because i'd had the idea before the pandemic um and like long before the pandemic and ended up um writing it and before the pandemic and it wasn't until we recorded the first season that covid was on and like and, and it was happening and i flew to london to record the first season i remember i had to quarantine for like 14 days before I could see any of the actors and that sort of thing. Um, and and I do just, I, I think, so part of it, I, I do just think hit with that sort of feeling of isolation, I guess, um, which I think, you know, you could draw some of that from the pandemic, but also I think it was a little bit before the pandemic of just the feeling like, um, you know, everybody's feeling sort of either because of social media and the like algorithmization of like everything that you're looking at, you feel sort of like cloistered into your own little silo, you know, and feel sort of like removed from the world. And so I think when we, especially when we come into it in the first season, there's this feeling of the characters in the castle that they're like, they're isolated from the outside world. They're like hiding from the outside world. 
And that's so interesting because even though you didn't intend for that to be the result, I'm sure one of the reasons the show did so well during the pandemic is it, it resonated with us just on yeah. that level. Um, I also wondered if, and again, I, I know you didn't intend this, but I wonder if like climate anxiety has anything to do with it. Um, the 100%. idea of, yeah. And, and even today, a lot of us feel like, you know, you don't know who to trust, who's who. It's hard to unravel what the truth is. So these people who live in this universe where, you know, you don't know if these people are, are vampires or not. I love that aspect of it. Well, it was yeah. so brilliant. And no, thank you. And I do, and I do think that's what like, climate anxiety definitely like has has a lot to do with it. You know, and I think that was probably even a little bit more intentional than than any sort of like COVID analogies. But also just the idea of like, um, yeah, the idea of trust and stereotyping. And I think like from the beginning, um, I, I sort of designed it to be like the, that. The first vampires that you met were these uh, were the the lowest sort of cast. This is sort of explicitly bestial, sort of screeching, clawing sort of creatures, and that was the first the first ones that you encounter in the podcast, and and part of that was because I wanted to kind of like okay now now let's see a character enter that world, and like and 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 find out that there's you know there's other kinds and there's there's other politics and there's like vampires who believe this and vampires who believe that and sort of like going from the the simplest view that you could have of a thing to going into it and then getting a view from the inside where you start to see all the sort of like complexities of this of of these these people that you that you just assumed were kind of just monsters yeah and i really enjoy that you're kind of slowly unraveling your universe's vampire mythos like it was great to learn more about the difference in their ranking and politics in season two could you tease like what other kind of history lesson we're going to get in season three? I know it's a little early, like we just launched season two, but can you tease like what other kind of history we're going to get uh, in season three? Season three is going to be a, a lot of fun because th that's um, I, and season three, we're going to we're going to basically be in the dead center of like the corridors of power in at least one of our storylines. We're going to be and finding out you know, all about the queen and the history there and the council and who each of them are and what each of them want. And I think there is there is kind of like, there's a, there's one storyline, one running storyline in season three. And always with the seasons, I like to sort of juggle a few storylines at once, but there's one there's one in season three that I, I think is probably the most Game of Thronesy of the storylines that we've dealt with so far. And that you really get into the, like the politics and the history of, of um the the very most powerful vampires yeah and again i love the way you've built this because audio stories are so hard to construct because you can't describe all these things you have to really do building blocks and you started with such a simple image these two people in an abandoned radio station just trying to get the word out and then encountering the monsters like you said you very slowly layered this so you could have never, like what you're talking about for season three, you could have never done for season one. It would have been no, way too absolutely. confusing. Not. Nobody would have listened to it, but <laughs> yeah, 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 you're no. building this whole world and it's just through dialogue. It's amazing. So I'm no, wondering, did a character's accent like become essential to the audio series? Because I noticed that the vampire overlord sounded almost royal, while the human survivors had more of like country or cockney accents. Yes, absolutely. that was absolutely part of it. And because also especially in the beginning when you had like two characters talking to each other and let's say, you know, they were two um, women of around the same age or two men of around the same age. I think I, I spent a lot of time thinking about like a lot of time in the first season thinking about, well, is there any way we can distinguish them more easily? Like um, have this character be Scottish or have this character, because even in like, even in England and, and I think even if Americans don't quite have, an ear to tell where people are from, specifically in England, they know Hagrid doesn't sound like Harry Potter. You know what I mean? You're a wizard, Harry. Like they right, know that those right, are two right. like different accents. So even in England, there's like all these sort of like very specific regional accents. And I was having sort of fun sort of assigning those to people and sort of like also using actors who naturally had, you know, accents that work. I was gonna ask because you are not English. So how much of this balance was you and, you know, like you going, hey, this one specific London dialect in this neighborhood, you do that one. Or how much did the actors get to bring to that? It was, I mean, in general, it was sort of the actors. Like I, I kind of, because I, I sort of hesitate to, um, 
I don't like to, to, to make people do accents that aren't their own accents. Because I, I think, and especially with, with, with a, such a dialogue like heavy performance, um, that I like the, when they're free just to not think about it at that level. You know, because even the best, best actors, you know, you know, could could ape almost any accent that you give them. But there's there's something special when they're doing a scene and they just don't have to think about that part of it, you know, and you get a, a, a new level of sort of like naturalism. So it was mostly stuff that we thought about in casting, like in just listening to people. I think, you know, when we were casting it, we wouldn't even like um, we didn't really have auditions, but we would l watch. Um, like interviews that people gave. I wanted to watch like interviews, you know, and, and just hear, hear their voices, you know, naturally and see, and see how they sounded without, without acting. I guess um, in a way that's a, a very liberating because a lot of the time in casting, you know, you're looking at headshots, you're thinking, yeah. well, they don't look quite right. Do they, can they use prosthetics or makeup? But for you, it's, it's literally just shut your eyes and you get to let your imagination run wild. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And yeah. Um, and just also, you know, also I think in interviews you just get sort of a sense of the of the person as well, and like if they're if they're going to be like if they're going to be fun to work with, you know, that sort of thing, just the energy that they give off. Because I think at a lot of times I, I'm, um, you know, and I, I used to say this on the on the TV show that that I created, I, you know, that I'm not I'm not really making a show; I'm making a community that makes a show. I want to backtrack real quick to something you just kind of dropped, but you know, we were talking about vampires, so I let it stay there. You said the show is, it, you know, in small part, influenced by Arthurian lore. Um, some of that's pretty obvious, castles, chosen one, things like that. Uh, but what specifically, um, I'm a big Arthurian lore guy myself, so like I'm always going to hit the brakes and stop and go back and ask about that. Yeah, what specifically, no you know, did you draw from? Well, I mean, um, just sort of like, in, you know, in the sort of most general sense, the idea of like, you know, coming in and there's a sword that's important. You know, there's Darcy's sword. But I think... Um, in you know, and I, I hesitate to be too specific, but there is some there's some loose sort of Grail mythology that becomes important um, later on, um, and in in a kind of unexpected way, you can't really set anything in the southwest of England without sort of nodding in some way towards Arthur. True, um, it's also great because it, very fitting because when you talk about post-apocalyptic stories, you know, especially ones where we get in like several years after the event. Uh, Walking Dead comes to mind, Last of Us comes to mind. People eventually do revert back. They revert to tribalism. You know, they revert to piracy or becoming marauders like in Mad Max. And you've done that here, but in a very different way where the reversion isn't necessarily with humanity. There's a little bit of that, but it's more like this old world old European queens and ruling councils and things like that, that, you know, Western civilization thought they buried, but it turns out it was just waiting to, to be activated again. Very yes. clever. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, I, I do see the vampires as being very, like, old world hierarchical. Like, there's, you know, the pecking order is very important to them. And, you know, like, what caste each, each of them is. And there's an explicit ruling class and, and an explicit sort of underclass. Now, um... This is all great, it's, it's fun world building, but none of it would work without the characters. And especially the characters of Darcy and Hope are two people who like, I got really attached to, and Felix, because I feel like in this universe, if I, I would, I'm, I'm Felix. Likewise, um, but I yeah. did notice, yeah, right? I mean, he's my, he's my proxy. It's like we hadn't met, but you wrote a part that's basically me. Um, but I did notice that like for a show that's dealing with the relationship dynamic between two sisters, they barely interact, but you can feel how close they are in the narrative. So like as a writer, can you share some of the key writing elements you implemented to make that work? They're, they're very rarely in the same room. I mean, it's a pretty yeah, incredible I mean, I, you well, off. I think, I think the best way to explain it is like uh, one of my favorite movies um, ever since like film school was The Third Man, um, who of course like, you know, Orson Welles playing Harry Lyon when he doesn't show up until like, you know, 20 minutes from the end or whatever. Um, but it's, but it has such gravity throughout that. And it's because people are constantly talking about him, constantly talking about Harry Lyme. And so there's, you know, that's one tool. It's like just having, um, having each of them sort of worried about each other and talking about each other. But it's also fun because when you, when you have them together, um, there's things that you can't say, 
right? There's because it's it's taken for granted that each of them knows each other. And when they're apart, you get to have things where it's like they get to tell each other story, you know, they get to tell the people around them stories about like, here's what Darcy was like when we were growing up. Here's what Hope was like growing up. So in a weird way, you're kind of learning more about them than you could if they were together because they would have no reason to talk about those things if they were together. Yeah, there's so much shorthand when you've known somebody your entire life. And it's like you, you it's like you haven't, you, you barely even remember the last time they were together, but it's like there's this gravitational right. pull. And yeah, that's what I tried to like do with this season is like, you know, and w with it all is just ha have it, have there be this sense of like, you know, that, that everything they do in a way is, is because of the other one. Like Darcy is, is singularly um, obsessed with and fixed on the idea of like saving the world and, and bringing back the sun um, in a way that I don't know that she would be if she didn't have this sister who she knew was going to grow up in it. And at the same time, Hope is like um, trying to step into Darcy's shoes and thinking a lot about like the mistakes that her sister made. Like how did her sister fill this role and how's Hope now going to fill it? What are the things that she's gonna do that are the same and what are the decisions that she's gonna make are, that are different? Yeah, and um, Darcy looking out for Hope, it's almost like even before she gets turned that Darcy recognizes that Hope may get to enter a promised land, you know, that she won't. She's almost like a Moses figure in that way in yeah. season one. Um, you, you mentioned Felix earlier. You know, the relationship dynamic between Darcy and Felix, it felt relatable for couples in the modern era. See, because Darcy's power doesn't threaten Felix, but he does struggle to find purpose and a place in her universe. It's almost as if Felix is like the just kin to Darcy's Barbie. Yes, Can you tease yeah. like how you're going to continue that conversation uh, going into season three? Oh yeah, no, it's a it's a lot of fun because you know I don't want to say too much about like the the end of season two because I know there's like some pretty unexpected things that happen, but uh, but I think one thing that I you know I, I love about their trajectory is that it comes from a place of like uh, friendship, like before anything else they were they were really the closest of friends in the bunker, and that and that that became a romance and I and I love their dynamic because I love that he is so i think it's so many times like i'm used to writing this this main character guy and we've all seen him he's in everything like he's like brooding he's got baggage he's dark you know and he's gonna like he's gonna he's gonna do dark things if he has to and and i was so sort of tired of writing that character and i think with felix i you know i, I thought like well what you know would it be possible and can there be like a romantic lead who's nothing like that you know like who is um who's closer i think to like you know myself or to like people that i know um who's not super comfortable with dangerous situations but is like but is like looking for his place and and wanting to be helpful yeah you know, he in the our video we compared him at least we sort of when you know you picture people who you already know and i, I pictured peter from the hunger games yeah. not as a direct parallel but there's a lot of that that root kindness in felix and that he's kind of darcy's guiding light yeah um so i i checked out your interview on audible's listen in and i loved how you characterized impact winter as a prestige television for audio now the sound department in these seasons are superb. Can you highlight some mechanics around how the production team creates this immersive listening experience? They so they have this uh, program. I don't know what it's called, um, but I, I've I've seen it in action like once, and it's like if you picture on your computer screen like a little square, a little box, um, and and in the middle of the box is a point, and that point is the listener. They can take tracks and place them in different places in that like virtual sort of cube and it will it will translate in the mix to positionally where it would be around you and the listener so it's like they can say oh I, we want this voice to come from the left or we want this voice to come from up here or even down here or like behind you and so when we're doing like our spotting sessions and like and i've got the script in front of me and we're listening just to the raw like takes the raw material uh, because it's all ensemble recording like we when we record it we have the actors um they're in separate booths reading into separate mics so we can get their tracks clean but they're reacting with each other and they're reacting in real time wow and is that so, true during COVID as well were you yes. able to do that 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's incredible. That is what, that is fantastic, and it really shows through. When we're doing like our spotting session, um, it's it's a lot of talking about like, you know, I, I'm I'm sort of talking to sound department. I'm saying, all right, this person's coming into the room, or um, this person is close or this person is far or they you know they, they're just walking up and they're tapping this person on the shoulder and being super super specific about the blocking that is incredible so the fact that the sound department was able to actually create this virtual space and like virtually place people standing in different positions and if you're listening like if you're listening on audible you can listen with dolby atmos if you have the devices and that really shines through that is incredibly cool yeah no it's it's fantastic and it's like that's so Getting the voices separately, even though the performances are simultaneous, getting the voices separately lets us move each voice around and put it wherever we want it to be. And that's Prestige TV for audio. So uh, my last question, it, it seems like season two kind of ended on this Empire Strikes Back like note, right? And I kind of felt like, again, spoiler alert here, uh, if you've come this far, you should have listened to season two already. But I felt there was something similar with Darcy, who was supposed to be the chosen one who would bring balance to the force, so to speak, became the emperor instead by being the reincarnation of the queen. So is there a world where that's a fake out, where it's just the queen convincing Darcy that she is her? Or is this the actual harsh reality that the whole cast is going to face in season three? Um, it is It is a harsh reality that, that I think everyone's going to have to face. Although I, I will say... Um, I will say everything is not quite as it seems like that, that the assumptions that you walk away from in, in season two, um, there's, there's different levels to what's going on that, that, that you're not aware of. And I, I just want to leave you with one other compliment, uh, with season two that just particular, particularly, like I thought reinvented the genre in a new way that really could have only been done with audio. Um, Vampire hypnosis is nothing new. You know, Dracula hypnotized people. It's a big thing on True Blood. What we do in the shadows gives you yeah. know, people get the brain scramblies if yeah, you do yeah. it too much. Yeah. Um, you were able to present hypnosis from the point of view of the hypnotized and do it in audio only. What a feat. It was so <laughs> much you. more immersive because it's making us imagine what we're seeing it's you know it's the shark in jaws it's way scarier before you see it i i was just blown away by that i thought that was so clever so creative and such a, an amazing reinvention of oh, no, the genre thank you. I pre hats no, off i so appreciate that yeah, yeah. well like very, the shark very in scary jaws, <laughs> like in shark the jaw in, in jaws i think necessity was also the mother of invention so a lot of those times it's sort of like you you just have a need to see something or not see something and then and then when you put it on paper you're like oh this is actually sort of fun this is clever i can have some fun with this okay so last question anything you want to kind of tease us about season three or anything to get our hopes up what what can we expect to see um well i like that you said get your hopes up <laughs> um because i think that in and of itself is a bit of a tease of what's going to happen in season three. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, and, and, and season, cause I'm writing it right now, uh, you know, um, and it's, and it's, and it's coming together. It's really, it's a devastating season. Like there's a lot of, like, especially the first half of it, there's a lot of like pretty like dark, things and struggling with things that are happening but it's i i'm finding it so 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 fun to write and so um and so rewarding to kind of really dig in on some of these characters and putting them through the paces and so i think season well, three is just going to be a whole other level of intensity after you broke my heart with whisper i don't know if i can take it um <laughs> travis thanks again for joining us it's been so enlightening so much fun to talk to you and thank you for creating this this wonderful series if you haven't checked it out yet and I'm, if you've watched this far i'm assuming you have but listen to it again impact winter the audible original and guys we want to hear from you down in the comments below do you have any questions for me for travis let me know in the comments at either of us on twitter and if it's your first time here please subscribe smash that bell for alerts for screen crush i'm ryan airy